you would speak to us in that small, still voice. Give us a sense of excitement and expectation as your word comes forth. Father, our prayer this morning is that everything we say and everything we do will glorify you. And we ask all of this in your most precious and holy name. And all the people said, amen. amen. Stand up, turn around, and shake hands with your neighbor. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Glorious day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, if you're brand new to Higher Ground Calvary Chapel and you would like a visitor card, a prayer card, or an offering envelope, there should be one right on the back of the chair in front of you. The offering will be received at the end of the service by the ushers at the door. Uh, if you're watching us online and you'd like to support this ministry, you can go to hgcc.org and there's a PayPal link there. We have here, we give food out to people that's in need here, non-perishable items. Um, the pantry is really getting low. Uh, there should be a list in the bulletin of things she needs, or you can see Carol in the kitchen, and she'll give you all the details in regards to that. Also, the next uh, Wednesday evening prayer fellowship will be April 24th at 7, so make note of that on your calendar. And the next relationship ministry is Saturday, April 27th. We also have a barbecue coming up. Um, on the 26th, you'll hear more about that as it gets closer. It's an all-church barbecue right after church. We'll have inflatables for the kids. We're also having a car show. Uh, we'll have food. It's just going to be a blessed time to fellowship. So put that on your calendar for the 26th. Also, people have asked in regards to the news with Israel and all. The Israel trip this year has been canceled. So if you're part of that group, you should have got an email from the uh, agency that's handling it. Um, due to the, some of the circumstances in Israel, we will not be going in September. We'll look at it again next year. Uh, so please make note of that. Other than that, I have two more announcements, but I'm going to let the, the people in charge of these uh, events come up first. I'm going to ask uh, Davida to come up. She has an announcement she would like to make. Good morning, church. <laughs> Um, so we'll be starting a grief share group. It's uh, on Mondays beginning April 22nd. Uh, we have sign-up sheets uh, both for a.m. and p.m. Right now we're not exactly sure exact time, so it's a.m. p.m. Uh, it will be a 13-week session, and myself, I've been through the grief share and uh, after the loss of my husband, and I can just speak for myself that it's, um, it's just, it's good. It's a, a place of healing, a place of support. Um, and uh, I just highly recommend it uh, for anyone that's had a loss of a loved one, a friend that you loved as well. Um, and this ministry, I know, has, just by reading up even more on it, has touched people worldwide. It's not just a small ministry. It's a worldwide ministry. Uh, again, it's a 13-week session. Um, there will be a video. Uh, it's about a 30-minute video, a time of discussion. And there's a workbook that goes along with it. And it's um, just for your personal growth uh, and uh, just utilize it so uh, God can speak to you and bring healing to your heart. And I'm just excited to see what God is going to do in the hearts of the people. Sign-up sheets are in the lobby. And uh, again, we don't have exact times, but it, we're taking sign-up uh, sign for a.m. and p.m. and see uh, how many people we can get uh, to 
uh, sign up and that will make a decision as to whether we're going to do evening, uh, but we hope to do evening. Um, so, and really it's not about the number. So if we, you know, two, three people, if they can't do morning, we'll do evening. So God bless you. And the last announcement, we have a, a conference coming up this coming Saturday. It's a women's conference for um, who will love me for me. But I'm not going to go any further into it. I'm going to let Victoria. It's the last chance to talk to you before the conference. So let's uh, listen to what Victoria has to say. Morning. So the conference is this Saturday. I'm excited to see what God is going to do. Who Would Love Me For Me conference is really to reach out to those who are broken, who have come from a background of any type of abuse, rejection, abandonment. And the Lord is good. I didn't even know I was going to share this morning. So this morning, I just go to the grocery store to buy snacks for the youth. Because <laughs> that's what I do. So I'm in line, and, and um, the lady was saying, so early in the morning, you know, the cashier, all this candy. And I said, it's for my kids. It's for the youth, you know. And I shared with her how I always pray for God to bring me broken, broken kids, you know. Because I said a lot of people don't reach out to those who are broken. And then she starts crying, and she's a cashier, and she says, you know, um, I have a story, and she says, and I like, I said, well, there's a conference coming up, you know, and she says, you know, she goes, I can't believe that someone is actually doing something like this to reach out to those who have gone through stuff, you know, and um, I, until she shared her story, it was similar to my story, most of you know that I come from that background of abuse, um, so women are going to come, and they're going to share their testimony, and these ladies are very brave to be able to come up and just open up their lives so it can help somebody else, because I always believe that what we go through is not for us. What we go through is the purpose to help somebody else, and if you, that person who gets saved and gets redeemed will help the next person and help the next person, what a world it would be if we stay here and just help each other with what we've gone through. So that's the conference. It's this Saturday at 9 o'clock, 9 to 12.30. There's a free lunch right after um, prayer, music, and we have a sister and others that decorates this place so beautifully. So I hope to see you guys there. All right, uh, if you're able to stand, please stand as we continue our worship service in song. I will enter his grace with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord Oh, 
Lord, for He has made me glad. He has made me glad, oh, He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for He has made me glad. He has made me glad, oh, He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for He has made me glad. He has made me glad, oh, He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for He has made me glad. I will rejoice, for He has made me glad. All right. Is everybody glad this morning? Praise God. Wow, oh, it's a beautiful day. I want to 
comfortable.
when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are.
said this on Wednesday nights and maybe in our men's Bible study but the song he knows my name and I believe that the name that God knows is the new name that we're going to receive when we get to heaven because the name that we have on earth is an earthly name but his name for us is a heavenly name and it's that heavenly name that's written in the book of life
Heavenly Father, you hear us. We cry out, Father, sometimes <laughs> early in the morning. And we cry out, Father, to you, and you always answer our prayers. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you, to worship you, to lift up your name, to praise you for who you are. And Lord, thank you for this brand new day. And we ask this in Jesus' name, and together we said, Amen. Good worship. Really, that is good stuff. Praise the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. It is, it is good to see you here. It's good to be, as, uh, as Pastor Jack always says, good to be in the house of the Lord. It is definitely good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, we had an incredible day yesterday. Uh, we had a men's conference here. It was packed out. It was incredible. We had uh, two great teachers uh, come, one from uh, Wildwood Calvary Chapel in Ukaipa. It's about 28 miles from here, Chris Frawley. And then uh, B.J. Heather, he is the senior pastor now um, out at Joshua Springs, which Joshua Springs is a long way out there. If you've been 29 Palms, anybody been up 29 Palms? So you know what I'm talking about. That's, that's out there. But um, they were great. It was just an incredible time of fellowship and just really just uh, worshiping the Lord. And it was a good feeding time uh, for all involved in it. And, and speaking of that also, uh, uh, the ladies in the kitchen, uh, you know, Carol, Kit, my wife, and others, they did a, an incredible job because when we meet, we eat. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Do I hear an amen? amen? Yeah, amen. Yeah, we do. We do. Today, we're going to take a look at Luke 13, verses 34 and 35, two verses. They couldn't be more apropos <laughs> than right now. When I say right now, I mean right now. Hear the heart of God for Jerusalem in these verses. These verses were written thousands of years ago about what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It's happening right now. You see it on the news. Israel is the center of God's universe. It is. It is. And these men that are here, Netanyahu and all the others, and the women... I haven't heard the news this morning, so I don't know what is happening, but we're going to pray right now. We're going to pray an extension of the prayer that Jesus prayed 2,000 years ago that you're about to read. How timely is that? God, we were going through scriptures just at the right time, and at the right time, we read these two scriptures, and this is in today's newspaper. That's God. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, and oh God, we pray that prayer that we're about to read that Jesus Christ spoke over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, God. Lord, we pray for Israel. We pray, Father, for peace. But, Father, realistically, we know that mankind can maybe cobble together a temporary peace, and that's what we pray for. But the real peace can only be when the peacemaker comes, and his name is Jesus Christ. There will be no lasting peace. Lord, we pray for Israel, though. We pray for the men and women there. Father, we pray also, Father, for Iraq. We pray, Father, for the opening of eyes, for drawing them to you. Yeah, drawing them to you. Father, that may sound like an impossible task, but, Father, you have, you have softened the hardest hearts you have. As we look, Lord, at history, we realize, Father, that 
the nations that have come up against this little nation, Israel, the desert is scattered. Their bones are scattered across the desert and dried out. The Egyptian army was at the bottom of a river. They're not fighting Israel. They're fighting you. So, Lord, we pray. We pray, Father, that there can be peace, some kind of peace, some way, somehow. There would be temporary, Father, that there would be no loss of lives, no more agony, at least for a season, Lord, we pray. We pray, God, with a broken heart, the same heart, Father, that Jesus had when he looked at Jerusalem, and he prayed. So, Lord, help us understand these scriptures today, these two little verses, Father. The heart of God, the heart of God for Jerusalem, the heart of God for us, Lord, for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke, the 13th chapter, we're going to take a look at these two verses. Jesus laments over Jerusalem, reading verse 34, and this is a comment. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Wow. Is that prophetic or what? It is. There is a great tenderness in these words as seen in the imagery of a hen and a chicken. And this outpouring of divine compassion foreshadows his weeping over the city that we're going to see in Luke 19, 41. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Wow. The clear, deep, sincere emotion. He says here, I would have gathered. And the translation there, really in the Greek, literally is this. I willed, but you willed not. That's how powerful that is. I willed that you would come to me but you will not. Now we look at Israel and we look at Jerusalem now and we see the devastation. Jesus was talking about an earlier devastation that was going to happen within 30, 40 years. Titus was going to come in and he was going to devastate the city. There wouldn't be one stone left on another. There would be slaughter. Now it's been 2,000 years and Israel is an incredible country, an incredible nation. But there are nations that want to wipe it off the face of the planet. Death to Israel. Death to the United States. The little Satan, we're the big Satan. That is a cry from the pit of hell. That is the pit of hell, literally. So, God poured out his heart. He will, but they will not. Many times in our own life, God has called you. He says, I, 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 I want you to be with me. I want you to draw close to me. And a lot of times, there are a lot of people that haven't received Christ because what? You will not. And I speak to you online. You have a free will. And people say over and over again, well, a loving God would not send someone to hell. You're absolutely right. Our loving God does not send a single person to hell. They send themselves there. Why? You willed not. You chose. It's a choice. Christ's repeated expressions of grief over the plight of Jerusalem did not diminish the reality of his absolute sovereignty over all that happens. You got to remember that. You have to remember this also. Nor should the truth of divine sovereignty be used to depreciate the sincerity of his compassion. There is a balance there. 
God's great love, God's great love for Jerusalem had been longstanding. God always wanted Jerusalem to come to him and let him, his covering, protect them like a hen protects the chicks. That's the picture that we're looking at right here. But they would not. They would not. They still would not. And look what is happening now. God had dwelt here in the city with his people. He had led his people out of Egypt. We know the story, right? He led them out of Egypt. He led them with his fire and his smoke for 40 years to the promised land. He did all of that. Solomon built a temple in Jerusalem where God dwelt with his people, but his people activated their what? Their free will to reject God's only son. And that's what we have. And when we activate that free will, I can choose to do God's will or I can choose not to do God's will. Now, speaking to believers, after you receive Jesus Christ, (laughs) after I've received Jesus Christ, I still have a free will. I can choose to follow what God wants me to do at that moment, or I could choose not to. It's free. I've been set free in order to do that. So I willingly accept what he wants for me and reject what I want from myself. That's the toughie. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's the toughie. Because our will is strong. Our, our will is strong. I always said, uh, you've heard me say many, many times, what is, what is descriptive of our will that compares to a movie franchise that was one of the really big movie franchises of the 80s and 90s? Die hard. Your will and my will dies hard. You can't kill it. It keeps coming back. It keeps coming back. It keeps coming back. It dies hard, like the battery, die hard battery. Yeah, it keeps coming back. Why? It wants what it wants. I want what I want. And God says, no, 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 give up what you want for what I will give you, and it will be better than what you want. But we can't see that. We're blinded. Why? By the stuff of the world. We're blinded. Israel was blinded at that time. Israel is blinded today. I don't know what's happening right now. I don't know who's firing what missiles or this. This much I do know from history. When Israel gets hit, they hit back twice as hard. They do. They've been dealing with giants since David. And they'll take on a giant. They will not back down. That's the one thing I do know. Israel doesn't back down. There's no retreat. What will that do? I don't know. Where are we in this picture? I don't know. What's going to happen? For sure, uh, the president and other people, they're meeting, they're trying to do, you know, and I, I give them credit in this sense. They're doing the best that they can. Maybe it's a lot of it is politically motivated. I get that. Maybe it is financially motivated. I get that too. That's, that's the world that we live in. Okay, uh, we don't live in a fantasy world. That stuff is out there. But I would pray somehow that God would get through to somebody somewhere in the United States and in Israel and speak to their soul and say, uh, why don't you try this? Try that. That may help the situation. Granted, it's a temporary help, but it will help the situation that women and children, men, old and young, won't be slaughtered on both sides. Because every man and woman, every soldier that is in Iran has a soul. Yeah. Yes, the ideology is totally what they want. I get that. But does God love them? Yes, he does. And he desires for them to be with him. But this whole scenario has to play itself out. Why? Go to the end of the book. (laughs) You know exactly what's going to happen. But Jesus, he lamented over this city. God had dwelt there, like I said, in the city with his people. He had led the people out of Egypt. He led them with fire and smoke and for 40 years of the promised land. Solomon built that temple in Jerusalem where God dwelt with his people. But his people, like I said, they activated their free will. And that was the issue. Jesus is warning 
over the beloved city, Jerusalem, when he says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he mourns over it. They rejected the prophets God sent, and then they rejected God's son. This is what happens when we reject God in our life on a personal level. What is it? Catastrophe. You say, wait a minute, my life is not a catastrophe. <laughs> we only think temporal. We do. The majority of our life, we think in a temporal way. This is solid. This is it. I need to do this. I, uh, I, I go to work. I, I earn money. I pay bills. I do that. I go here. It's all temporal. It's all, te- it's, it's all temporal. <laughs> it's all going to burn. One day it will burn. It's all gone. What about eternity? What about thinking there instead of just thinking here? Because we get caught up with the world. That's it. They rejected the prophets. I say with you, and I say with Jesus Christ, Jerusalem. Look at verse 35, that second verse. See, he starts, in other words, pay attention. Your house is left to you desolate. And assuredly, I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's a quote. He's quoting scripture. Wow. Wouldn't it be great if he came now, right now, to where Israel's eyes would be open? I have no idea what's happening right there. It's, it's like nighttime right now. It's probably 12 o'clock at night or something like that. This account of Luke's clearly falls at the earlier point of Christ's ministry. Then the parallel account, you might want to write down Matthew 23, verses 37 and 39. Matthew 23, 37 and 39, which took place in the temple during Christ's final days in Jerusalem. The wording of the two laments, basically, is nevertheless virtually identical. The wording is identical. This is identical, what was taking place here... Christ delivers prophetically the same message he would later pronounce as a final judgment. He's giving the same message. That's exactly what it is. Jesus now speaks to them that this is their house. Now watch this. This is their house. What are you talking about? They have taken it away from God with their evil will. This is your house now. You deal with it. What am I saying? God is simply saying, you want your will? All right. You've got it. I'll see you in a thousand years. God has eternity. Time is not on our side. Time is on his side. You want your will? Go ahead. It's your house. Do what you will. That is the most tragic statement that any person could hear, individually or a nation could hear. You want your will? You got it. Go for it. How is that working for you? It's not working at all. We look at Jerusalem today, and you can see it's not working at all. It will never work. Why? Because the creation has to follow the creator. But the creation wants a mind of his or her own, which God has given to us, the ability of having the free will. But the beauty of that is, he says, of your own free will, turn your will back over to me. Now my will becomes your will. That's what he's saying. And that's what the scripture teaches you and I, that his will will become our will. God will give you the desires of your heart. What? He will put his desires in your heart, therefore they're your desires. They're actually his desires in your heart, so when you ask, you're asking in his will, therefore it will be done. We walk right by that and we don't see that. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus clarified that in the garden. The act of surrender in the garden was the act that you and I need to do every day. 
I surrender. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. The song wasn't written. Some to him, some I surrender. <laughs> some to him I freely give. No, all. It's a fascinating word in the Greek. The word in the Greek, all, means all. <laughs> Everything. Everything I got. The Lord is yours. Everything. That's it. Jesus now speaks to them that this is their house. They have taken it away from God with their evil will. They will not, they will not receive the Lord at this time. They are blinded with the very law that God had given them to set them free. Grab that. The very law that God gave them to set them free blinded them. And it's still blinding them. They have a blind over. They cannot see. They cannot see. I told you the story that I was a chaplain for the Los Angeles Sheriff Department as well as reserve deputy for 15 years. And I can remember we would go into chaplain's meetings. Once a month we'd go, and this would be at uh, the sheriff headquarters. This was one in Monterey Park. And Raul was a chaplain also. So Raul and I would go. We'd go to the meeting. And the Los Angeles Sheriff Department is massive. Uh, to give you a perspective, the, the Riverside Police Department has 498 officers that deal with Riverside, okay? Riverside's a pretty big place. 498 officers, that, that's a lot. <laughs> Put it in perspective. I was at the Walnut Diamond Bar Sheriff Station. Just the Walnut Diamond Bar Sheriff Station alone had 350 deputies. There's over 20,000 deputies in Los Angeles. You realize how big Los Angeles is? It is huge. But we would go to the meeting, and we went through a time to where uh, each, it was basically, you had Protestant pastors, you had Catholic priests, and you had rabbis. I know that sounds like a joke I'm about to tell. <laughs> okay, well, the Catholic priest said to the rabbi, no, <laughs> no. We're there, and the Catholic priest would get up uh, one month, and he would share about the sacraments and stuff like this and everything. It was, it was good. It was good. Uh, and we would get up, and we would share, you know, about Protestant and so forth. Everybody open-minded, nobody, you know, closed-minded and stuff like this. It, it, it did work. It really, really did. But we were there, and the rabbi got up, and he started talking about this, and he'd go through the Old Testament, and he's talking. And then he did a Passover service, and he's doing this. And Raul and I go, oh, look. He's talking about Jesus right there and the Passover. And then you, you, you take the, 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 the matzah and you put it together and you have the one in the middle and you hide. That's Jesus right there. And he and I are talking that everything that he's talking about is Jesus. He can't see Jesus. You are talking about the Messiah right there. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's Jesus. Uh, no, that's talking about Israel. It says he. It doesn't say thee. It doesn't say those. It says he in the Hebrew, in your own language. No, no, no. It's about Israel. Blinded. They cannot see. They cannot. And I say, I, and I'm almost 40% Jew, so I can get away with this. It's true. You can't, they can't see. They can't. One day they will. When? Jesus said, when you, that day, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But before that comes, there will be horrific times for Israel. Horrific times. We look right now and we see the news and what is happening. And that is horrific. That's horrible. And just the thought of people's lives, women and children and so forth, uh, being murdered. That is horrific. That is nothing compared to the book of Revelation. That is nothing compared to that time. When after three and a half of the seven years, the Antichrist walks in and sits down and says, I am God, you will worship me. And their eyes are open. And what will they say? What have we done? What have we done? It will be wholesale slaughter. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how his heart wept for them, how his heart weeps for them now. How his heart weeps for you if you don't know him now. 
That same weeping, Christ is weeping for you. What? To come to Him, to let Him love you, to let Him receive you. Jesus is speaking prophetically here of the day in the future when they will see Him coming in the clouds. Then what? Then everyone will bow to Him and confess that He is Messiah. Everyone. You say everyone? Yeah. Every knee will bow, the Bible says, and every tongue confess. Now, you can bow of your free will, or you can be forced to bow. But those who reject Jesus Christ, they will bow. They will bow. They will do it out of absolute agony, out of absolute pain, but they will bow. Why? Every knee will bow. Why? To him. I desire in my lifetime here, and I believe you do too, and I pray that you do too as I'm talking to you, I gladly bow the knee to the Lamb. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Because if you don't bow before the Lamb, you will bow before the Lion of Judah. I guarantee you will. That line of that song about the lion is true. Every knee will bow. That word blessed, it's a quote. You might want to write down Psalms 118, verse 26. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Psalms 118, verse 26. It reminds you of a story. He's a small child, not even old enough for school. A winner than one of those mirrored mazes. Everybody went, ever gone into those things where you got the mirrors and you're trying to find your way out? You know, and you, you slam into a mirror and realize, or a piece of glass because, right? Well, the little girl went in there. When her father discovered that she had, you know, sl- slipped away and saw her trying to find her way to, uh, you know, to find the beginning of this thing, she began to, to cry because she was fearful. She became increasingly confused by all the paths until she heard her daddy call her and say, don't cry, honey. Put out your hands and reach around and you'll find a door. Just follow my voice. As he spoke, the little girl became calm and soon found her way out and ran to the security of her father's outstretched arms. What is that? God's voice is calling us from the confusion of the maze of this life. He is calling. Jesus is tenderly calling, calling to you. That's a hymn. He calls. Do you hear? Do I hear? We are hearing as God calls to us through his yearning, through his wooing, his longing, his pleading heart. He is pleading, literally pleading. God yearns for us. He he yearns for the time when we will be with him again. He yearns for the time when the relationship between him and his creation will be perfect as it once was in the first two pages of the Bible. You have all those pages in your Bible. Only the first two pages, everything was honky-dory. Great. Page three. (laughs) Chapter three, Genesis. Everything fell apart. And God took the rest of the entire book to bring us back to the beginning of the book. That's what he's doing. God yearns for that. Jesus laments for Jerusalem as he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. They would not. It's not that they will not. They would not. They would not. Jesus is expressing to us this morning that yearning of God. Have you felt the yearning of God in your life? Have you taken the time to shut out the stuff in your life and just listen to the yearning of God? Speak, have God speak to you. People go, no, no, Rex, you know, are you hearing voices, Rex? Okay. I hear voices. No. (laughs) No. But you can hear God speak to you. Yes, you can. Yeah. You're saying, how does he do that? 
He does it when you're by yourself. You got to shut yourself. The other day, I was going through a whole bunch of stuff in my head, and I need to clarify stuff. So I went out of the house, up in New Kaipa, put on a jacket because it was really cold the other day. <clears throat> and I'm walking. There's a lot of walking paths. You can walk for miles and just. And so I'm just walking, and I'm just saying, okay, God, uh, talk to me. Speak to me. Like Elijah, there's no thunder. You know, Cecil B. DeMille is not there setting the thing up with Charlton Heston. <laughs> okay. No special effects, no lasers. My voice is not in the wind. It's not in the earthquake. It's not in any of that. It's a still, small voice. Are you listening to me? Where does it come from? The Holy Spirit. He's in you. So the voice comes from within. Not here. Here. The voice of calmness. The voice of reason. It's going to be okay. Trust me. We need that. I need that. Shut out the stuff in your life. Everybody here, anybody got stuff? I got stuff. You got, we all got stuff. I got more stuff. I need running boards on my plate to hold the stuff that I got. Okay? We all got stuff. Let God handle it. Now, can you imagine the ache and the, and the hurt in God's heart as he yearns for Jerusalem to come to him, as he yearns for you if you haven't come to him, as he yearns for his child even, who has said yes to him, to follow him in a greater degree. Jesus says, he often would, I have gathered your children together as hens. Jesus is lamenting over all of this situation. God has tried to bring the fallen creation back to him from Noah to Jesus. Grab all that for a second. Manoah to Jesus. God has tried in all kinds of manner to make the relationship between him and his people right. And I'm not just talking about the Jew. Yes, the Jew. But what? I'm looking at his people. Why? He created you. He knew you were in your mother's womb. He knew when you were going to be born. He knew your, he knew your name before you knew your name. I can't even talk now. You, you knew your name. <clears throat> he did. God tried so many ways. God tried through Noah and a flood. He tried through Moses and the prophets. God tried through the judges. He tried, go through the Old Testament. He tried all of this. What? God has tried in all kinds of manner to make the relationship between him and his people right. God has tried to woo to win back, to persuade his people to come back to him. Through the history of the Old Testament, God worked with the people of Israel trying to win them back. He has. But at last, it was to no avail. As Jesus says in our text, what does Jesus say? You would not. How many times have, as I'm talking to you online, I'm talking to people in the chapel, how many times, if, I'm talking about if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, has God tried to woo you? And you came that close. There was a person who was talking to Paul, and Paul was trying to convince him to become a Christian. And this person who was a leader said, Paul, you've almost persuaded me. But go away and come back another time, and maybe we'll talk about that. There was never another time. There will never be another time. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. I have no guarantee of the sun coming up tomorrow. Israel, 
Jerusalem has no guarantee what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. You who are sitting here, you who are online right now, and I speak to myself too, have no guarantee of what's going to happen within the next 24 hours. None. The world is literally on the brink of a world war. And it's not going to be World War I. It's not going to be World War II, which ended in a nuclear holocaust. It's going to be a million times greater than that. What is God doing? God the Father decided he would send Jesus to reconcile them and to bring humanity back. What did God do for you and me? This is what he did. What humankind would not do for itself, God did for them. What you would not and could not do for yourself, God did for you and he did for me. Why? Calvary. Jesus Christ on Calvary settled it all. What's the song? Calvary covers it all. It covers it all. It handles it. This was a situation. This is the great news of the gospel, really, for Israel today and for you and for me. God decided that man could not be won back, so the Father decided what? We're going to send Jesus, we're going to send my son, and these are the things that are going to happen and make it happen. This is what the situation was. This is what was taking place. But they would not, so God decided if he came among his people, if he walked with his people, if he spoke to them as one of them, and the great love that he had for them, maybe that would take place. Maybe they would. Maybe they would listen. Maybe they would understand how he longed to have the right relationship with his people. So, we all know what he did. God became flesh. He struck a tent of flesh, as the theologians say. He struck a tent of flesh. And what? He tended among his people. He lived among his people. He walked with his people. He hurt with them. He taught them. And he pleaded with them. He walks and he pleads with you as a believer to walk closer to him and walk further away from the world. He pleads with a non-believer to come to him because the road that you're traveling down has a dead end. And when I say dead, I mean dead. It's a dead end. It's kind of like the story of long ago that there was a ruler in Persia. And he was a wise, good king. And and he loved his people. And he wanted to know how they lived. And so he wanted to know about their, their hardships. And as the story goes, often he dressed and he clothed himself in working man, maybe rags or something. And he would walk around with the poor. No one whom he visited, thought that he was their ruler. And one time he visited a very poor man who lived in a cellar. And he ate the coarse food of this poor man, ate, and he, he spoke cheerful and kind words to the man. Then he left. And later, he came back and he visited this man again. And he disclosed to the man his identity. I'm your king. Well, as the story goes... The king thought that the man would surely ask for some kind of gift or or a favor that he would get. But he didn't. Instead, the poor man said this, You left your palace and your glory to visit me in this dark, dreary place. You ate my coarse food. You brought gladness to my heart. To others... You have given your rich gifts, but to me, you gave yourself. Guess who? Jesus Christ. He did that. He did that. This is the way in which Jesus came to us. He came what? Disguised as a lowly man, but inside that fleshly body was God in the flesh. There is truly a wonderment about God when we look at this. A wonderment for Israel today, a wonderment for you, a wonderment for me. He does all he can to bring the relationship between us together. He walks with his people. I love that hymn. Uh, Songs click in my head all the time. 
And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. If you don't know Christ, you will never know that joy. You will never know it. The world can never give it to you. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. I don't care if you have the corner office. I don't care if you're Elon Musk. And I would pray if you're Elon Musk and you're watching this, you turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because when it's all said and done, you can sell all the electric cars you want. You can put people on Mars. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're headed to hell, Elon. You need Jesus. It's just that simple. Write me. He walks with us and he talks with us. This is what he does. All of this is part of his lament in these two verses. What was the story? He is raised from the dead for his people. That's you and me as well. He gives them the free gift of salvation and then he gives them the free choice to take that gift or leave it. That's the gospel right there, that one paragraph. That's it. That's the whole gospel. You have the choice. I have a choice. All of this is part of the lament that he has. If we went through all of this stuff for a certain group of people, we would demand that they take this gift, period. That would be it, but not God. He opens it up, and he gives us the ability to choose. God is telling us that he has done all of the work of bringing his creation and himself back together. All you need to do is reach out and take it. That's what he's saying. He says it to you and he says it to me. He knows he could not woo them back. He knows he could not woo us back, and so he did that. He chose Jesus Christ. God yearns for you to accept this gift of salvation if you haven't. God yearns for this relationship with him to be right, and that's it. Salvation is present here in the Word of God today. Salvation is present for Israel today. Salvation is present for you, if you haven't received Christ, or if you have, to walk closer to Him. Salvation is for you, if you haven't received Christ, you can know Him today. An unknown author wrote this. <clears throat> Longfellow, the great poet, he could take a, sheet, take a sheet of paper, write a poem on it, and make it worth $60,000. That's talent. Rockefeller, for those of you who know Rockefeller who was, well, he was an early form of Elon Musk. Rockefeller could sign a piece of paper and make it worth millions of dollars. That is capitalism. A mechanic can take material worth five bucks, make it into an article worth 50 bucks. That's skill. A merchant can buy an article for $10, put it on his counter, and sell it for 25 bucks. That is business. But God can take a worthless, sinful life like mine, wash it, cleanse it, put his Holy Spirit in it, and make it a blessing to all humanity. Folks, that's salvation. Amen. That's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. That's what he wants to do with Israel. That's what he wants to do with Iran and Iraq and all of the people. He desires to do that as that salvation is available for all who choose to accept it. God's voice comes to us in what? The maze of life, like that mirrored room with that little girl. How do I get out of this? Listen to the Father. I'm here. It's okay. Come this way. Come this way. Come the way of the cross. I got you. I love you. Come on. How many people long to have Jesus Christ do that to you? Oh, I love you. I love you. I love it. I remember when Nancy was little, I used to love hugging Nancy. Used to hold her. I can't hold her now, but I, I can't pick her up now, but I still tug her. And little Annalise, I love holding her. I love hugging her. Something about that. 
as a father or of a grandfather, there's something special about that. Your father desires to do that to you. I don't care if you're six years old or 96 years old. Your father desires to do this to you. Oh, does he? He aches. His arms ache to do that. He brings us through the maze of life. He calls to us to come to him to believe in his promises for our lives. In these two verses that we have, we just had the two there, we can hear the heart of God speak. Jesus said himself, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Are you, am I listening to him this morning? Can you hear him calling your name? Come. Come to him. He calls us. He calls us to believe. He calls you and he calls me. He calls Israel. He has given us salvation. He calls us to be right in a right relationship with him. He calls us to be his people, to worship, to praise him, for him to be our God. What does he do? He calls us in grace. What does he do? He calls us in love. What does he do? He calls us to be his. That's what he does. Could I have the worship team come back up? You know, this message is a broad message and it's a narrow message. It's a message to everyone who may not know Jesus Christ. It is a message that we all need to hear. I close with a little poem. It's entitled, God Can. When you feel unlovable, unworthy, and unclean, when you think that no one can heal you, remember, my friend, God can. When you think that you are unforgivable for your guilt and your shame, remember, my friend, God can. When you think that all is hidden and no one can see within, remember, friend, God can. And when you have reached the bottom and you think that no one can hear, remember, my friend, God can. And above all, remember this. When you think that no one can love the real person deep inside of you, Remember, my friend, God can, and he will. Let's stand, shall we? Heavenly Father, I come before you, and you are the God of God can. Oh, Lord, as Jesus looked upon that city 2,000 years ago, and he cried, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. Today, we see Jerusalem, we see Israel, Father, in the midst of we don't know what's going to happen next. But, Lord, we look at our own lives and we realize you called out to us individually. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. Take my yoke upon you. It is light. It is light. Let me guide your life. Oh, Lord, I pray right now with every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's a person inside this chapel that is not sure of your salvation, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you wherever you are. If there's anybody here, if you have any doubt at all that you are saved, in other words, if you were to die within the next one hour, you know for sure you're going to be in heaven. If you have any doubt whatsoever, raise your hand right now. I want to pray. I'm going to pray with you. I want to pray right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. It's a simple prayer. You could say it in your mind or you could say it out loud, what, however you want to do this. And it's not about the words it is about the intent of your heart. God sees your heart right now. He knows your will. Speak to him and simply repeat these words from me to him, either audibly or in your mind. Simply say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. God, I want you in my life. God, I turn my life over to you. 
Save me. Give me salvation. Forgive me my sins. I repent of my sins. I turn around. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my God. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer, either here in the chapel or online, I want to welcome you as my brother and sister in Christ. You see, we don't, here at Higher Ground Calvary Chapel, it's not about people turning their life over to a church or a pastor or a religion or denomination. It's receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because when it's all said and done, when you get to heaven, they're not going to have a church name above the door. (laughs) You're going to be face to face with Jesus Christ. And he's going to say to you, because today you said yes to him, come here, my child. I love you. I love you. I love you. I long for that. I want to thank you for receiving Christ. I want to thank you for opening up your heart to Christ right now. We're going to have a time of prayer. And people that are going to help us with prayer, if they come forward, Pastor Jack and others. And if you have prayer about anything, while they're playing this song, you come forward and let's pray with you.
Father, we come before you right now. God, I thank you for this service. Lord, I thank you for every man and woman here. And I ask a blessing on every single person here. Lord, you know our hearts. You, you know we are but dust. But God, you love us. And in our heart, in our soul, each one of us is longing for those arms to come around us. And I pray that God speaking to you right now and telling you, my Holy Spirit is doing this on the inside. My Holy Spirit is hugging you on the inside. He's loving you. He's loving you. And He will always love you every day of your life. And then one day, you're going to stand face to face with me. And when you do, I'm going to hug you like you've never been hugged, like you have never been hugged. Because then, and only then, we will really know the love of God. May God bless you. May God watch over you today, throughout this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a blessed week. Woo! He has me.